Hello everyone, thanks for joining us for this Part B CERT Findings Lab Test Webinar designed for those who submit claims on the CMS 1500 claim form or the 837 Professional Electronic Claim. My name is Mary Moko. I'm a specialist on the Provider Outreach and Education Team at WPS Government Health Administrators, also known as WPS GHA. I will be your speaker today. Assisting me is my friend and colleague, Ellen Barra, who will be helping with some of the technical duties. Also representing WPS today are Denise Stanley, Jane Dingy, and Jamie Bell, all staff on the WPS GHA Medical Review CERT team. We begin today's presentation, uh, just as we do with all of our education, with this disclaimer statement. The purpose of this statement is to remind learners that although we made every effort to provide current information that is correct, the information is subject to change. It is on the CMS website where you will find the Medicare rules that determine final coverage. These laws and regulations and rulings will always prevail. We will provide responses to questions based on the facts given. And just as a reminder, CMS prohibits recording of this presentation for profit making purposes. The agenda for today's webinar includes only those topics that we advertised we would cover during this webinar. This webinar focuses, as I mentioned, on those claims submitted on the CMS 1500 or the 837P electronic version. During today's event, just as advertised, I will provide an overview of the CERT program. I'm going to talk about the top root causes for lab errors provide some documentation examples and some valuable resources. I'll begin with this overview of the Comprehensive Error Rate Testing or CERT program. CMS implemented the CERT program to measure improper payments in the Medicare fee-for-service program. CERT is designed to comply with the Payment Integrity Information Act of 2019, and part of that law requires the calculation of an annual Medicare fee-for-service improper payment rate, which is published in the Health and Human Services Agency Financial Report. The CERT program ensures a statistically valid random sample, therefore the improper payment rate calculated from this sample is considered to be reflective of all of claims processed by Medicare fee-for-service during the report period. CMS also uses the CERT program to perform special studies and supplemental measurements to determine the improper payment rates of particular claim types. The CERT program is also capable of producing other statistical measurements such as error-prone provider rates. Calculations of these rates facilitate CMS's ability to take corrective actions to reduce improper payment. Now just as a reminder, and it's very important to note that the improper payment rate is not a fraud rate, but it is a measurement of payments that did not meet Medicare requirements. The current CERT contractors are listed here on this slide. Uh, you can see the first is the CERT review contractor, often referred to as the CERT RC and sometimes referred to as the CRC. The name of that company is Empower AI and they are responsible for sampling uh, claims, requesting and receiving all medical records. They image the medical records that are returned and of course they would need to perform quality control on those imaged records. They provide customer service and education support. They actually perform the review of the medical records. They compile the data. And another important responsibility of the CERT review contractors, the maintenance of the CERT provider website, the CERT status or claim status website which is used by the MACs like WPSGHA and they also maintain the CERT management website that is used by CMS. The CERT statistical contractor or CERT SC or CSC is 
the Lewin Group Incorporated, and it's their responsibility to calculate the improper payment rates and amounts. They also develop the sampling strategy that's used to identify the sample claims, and they maintain the live data dashboard. This slide provides the steps in the CERT process. The CERT RC, the review contractor, selects a claim sample using a statistically valid random sample. Medical records are requested and reviewed, and if the CERT review contractor identifies an error, they assign an improper payment category. Finally, the CERT statistical contractor, the CERT SC, calculates the improper payment rates. CERT identifies an improperly paid claim as any duplicate payment, payment for services not received, payment for an incorrect amount, or payment for non-covered or allowable services. And for each of the errors identified, CERT assigns a category. I'll talk more about those categories in just a couple of minutes. When the review contractor assigns an error, they provide a notification to the MAC in what's called feedback files. And the MAC reviews the same documentation that is shared by the CERT review contractor. And sometimes the MAC may file a dispute if the MAC disagrees with the error finding. And if necessary, the MAC will contact the provider for more records in order to reverse the error. And that's where that team of individuals that I mentioned earlier from our uh, medical review CERT staff uh, is essential to rendering all of this all of these actions. You know, they're contacting the provider if there's something missing from the records and so on and so forth. Uh, they would also be instrumental in filing the dispute if the MAC disagrees with that error finding. So if new records are received when we reach out to them, we would up, reach out to the provider, that is, we would upload those records and then request that the CERT contractor review them. The CERT review contractor will send feedback to the MAC. The error may be reversed. However, if there is an overpayment identified, the MAC recoups the monies. If there is an underpayment, the MAC would adjudicate the claim and then make payment to the provider or supplier. Either way, whether it's an underpayment or an overpayment, it is an improper payment. Here are the major improper payment error categories that I touched upon just a little bit earlier. These are assigned by the CERT contractor when the CERT contractor finds an improper payment. The first of the major improper payment error categories is incorrect coding, and this would mean that medical documentation was indeed received, but it supports that a different code should have been submitted or that the service was performed by someone other than the billing provider or supplier. It also may mean that services were unbundled or the beneficiary was discharged to a site other than the one coded on the claim. Sometimes an error is assigned as medical necessity, uh, documentation, and the records that are received would uh, seem inadequate to support payment for the services billed. I apologize there, I got off a little bit on my uh, my slides. So there are other major categories that might be assigned also, and they are here on this slide. No documentation, and this is when the provider or supplier does not respond, or the provider or supplier responds, but they don't have the requested documentation when the CERT contractor requests it. Another improper payment major error category is insufficient documentation, and that means that the documentation was submitted, but it was inadequate to support payment for the services billed. And finally, there is a category that's called other, and this is for those errors that don't fit into any of the other payment or the other categories for errors. I've got a couple of those listed there for you: duplicate payment errors or non-covered or unallowable services. Here are the 2022 and 2023 Medicare fee-for-service improper payment rates, also appearing on this slide 
is the estimated dollars in improper payments and I've included a link to the CERT reports later in my presentation. Now I'm going to begin discussion of the top root causes for lab errors. Here are reasons for errors on those claims submitted to Medicare for lab services. As you can see, there's quite a lengthy list for those items that are missing, such as the provider's intent to order. Uh, also, documentation that would support medical necessity may be missing. Uh, perhaps the documentation to support frequency is missing, and so on and so forth. Sometimes the order is provided, but it is inadequate. On to the next slide, and this provides greater details on documentation requirements for labs. Any physician who treats a patient must order all diagnostic x-rays, diagnostic lab tests, or other diagnostic tests for a specific medical problem. There should be documentation uh, that the provider uses, uh, uses those results, that is, to manage the patient's specific medical problem, and they also may provide a consultation. We don't consider tests not ordered by the physician to be reasonable and necessary, and that is the overarching criteria for Medicare payment. The services must be reasonable and necessary. When completing progress notes, the physician or provider should clearly indicate all of the tests that are to be performed. Uh, for example, simply stating in the medical record to run labs or check blood alone doesn't support an intent to order. Medical review contractors consider diagnostic test order requirements are met if there is a signed order or requisition that lists the specific tests, an unsigned order or requisition that lists the specific test, and an unauthenticated medical record supporting the physician's intent to order the tests. Remember, order labs or check blood or documentation such as repeat urine is not acceptable for Medicare. An unauthenticated medical record supporting the physician's intent to order specific tests would also be uh, requirements that are met. As the sub-bullets on this slide show, unsigned orders are not subject to signature attestation. Unsigned or non-legible progress notes are subject to signature attestation. For those unaware of the definition of an attestation statement, it is a statement that is signed and dated by the author of a medical record entry, and this attests to the fact that he or she rendered the service. There are requirements for attestation statements. For example, the statement or the attestation must include beneficiary identifiers and information. And I'll provide you with a resource that uh, for that uh, attestation statements that is on this next slide. And here it is. For more Medicare signature requirements, we highly recommend the CMS Medicare Learning Network Matters number MM6698. The title of that document is Signature Guidelines for Medical Review Purposes. And this is an informative article that defines all of the items listed here on the slide. A handwritten signature, a signature log, an attestation statement. A handwritten signature is a mark or a sign by an individual on a document to signify knowledge, approval, acceptance, or obligation. Providers will sometimes include in the documentation they submit a signature log, and this identifies the author associated with initials or with an illegible signature. The signature log might be included on the actual page where the initials or illegible signature are used, or it could be a separate document. And to be considered valid for Medicare medical review purposes, that log must be a part of the patient's medical record. Reviewers will consider all submitted signature logs regardless of the date it was created. 
Now for an attestation statement to be considered valid for Medicare medical review purposes, that statement must be signed and dated by the author of the medical record entry. And it must of course contain the appropriate beneficiary identification uh, information that I touched on just a little bit ago. This article goes more into detail on that. Claim reviewers will not consider an attestation statement where there is no associated medical record entry or for or from someone other than the author of the medical record entry in question. So even in cases where two individuals are in the same group, one may not sign for the other in the medical record entries or the attestation statements. Now, if a signature is missing from an order, like a lab order, claim reviewers will disregard the order during the review of the claim. An attestation statement cannot be used for unsigned orders. Reviewers will consider all attestations that meet the guidelines regardless of the date that that attestation was created, except in those cases where the regulations or policy indicate that a signature must be in place prior to a given event or a given date. For those providers that order or refer lab services upon request for a Medicare claim review, return all necessary documentation, including the lab results. This includes the services that you may not have directly billed for. For example, if the CERT contractor selects a claim submitted by an outside laboratory, the ordering or referring MD must comply with any documentation requests that he or she receives for that selected claim review. Now in those cases where the CERT contractor finds that a lab was improperly paid, unless the documentation supports that other labs were billed that required that venipuncture, Medicare will not allow the venipuncture. So in other words, if there's documentation to support the lab service um, is not received and Medicare denies payment for that lab, then Medicare is also going to deny the venipuncture for that lab or consider it to be not medically necessary. Uh, as such, the CERT contractor will assign an additional error to the venipuncture code if the submitted uh, claim being reviewed is found to be an error. So in other words, if a particular service or lab service was deemed not covered or not payable by the CERT contractor, then the associated venipuncture is also not covered, unless of course there are other labs that are being billed on the same day. Other covered labs, I should say. Now this slide shows the uh, Code of Federal Regulations or cites the section of those regulations that speaks to the requirements to maintain documentation for seven years from the date of service. Uh, this section of the CFR or Code of Federal Regulations also speaks to the requirement for providers to provide access to documentation. One CMS publication is clarification of ordering and certifying documentation requirements. And this particular article, uh, your, your uh, presentation materials, of course, includes links to all of these resources that I'm mentioning. Uh, this particular article provides CMS guidance for providers or suppliers who furnish covered ordered items, including clinical laboratory services. Uh, this article actually clarifies the term access to documentation. It also provides examples of sufficient and deficient access. And for those non-compliant individuals that don't allow access to the documentation or those entities who do not comply with documentation requests, they are subject to revocation. When a provider receives a request for records from the CERT contractor, it's important to submit all needed documentation. And for lab tests, the items listed here on this slide 
are what should be included in the documentation that is returned to the CERT contractor. Of course, we're looking for, or the CERT contractor would be looking for uh, clinic and office notes, test results, reports or pathology reports. Uh, there's also going to be um, a need to send those physician orders. Uh, if not including orders, then you need to send uh, the medical record documentation that shows or proves the intent to order those billed diagnostic tests. And also the physician or non-physician practitioner progress notes would need to be included in order to help support medical necessity. Other items to consider sending to the CERT contractor are listed here for any lab service where you believe the likelihood that Medicare will deny is not medically necessary, you need to include a copy of the Advanced Beneficiary Notice of Non-Coverage or the ABN that's issued to the beneficiary if indeed one was issued. This would include any lab that has a frequency parameter for coverage. Now make certain the date of service and the specific lab is identified on the ABN. Be specific. Don't just add a general statement such as Medicare won't pay for this lab. State why Medicare won't pay for the lab. I've included a link for you on this slide uh, for a CMS educational tool that does provide requirements and step-by-step -step instructions for completing each section of the ABN. I know that some of my teammates have provided education about the ABN in the past, and you'll be able to find recordings for those uh, educational webinars out on our YouTube channel. When providing electronic health records, include a copy of the electronic signature policy and procedures that describes how your electronic notes are ordered uh, and orders rather are signed and dated. And one last helpful reminder is to check for signatures before sending items to the Medicare contractor. Uh, if missing or illegible, you should consider submitting an attestation for any office or progress notes where the signature is um, missing or illegible, as I mentioned, and if that signature is illegible, remember that you can also send a signature log. A signature attestation does not, however, apply to a lab order. It can only be used for office or progress notes. All right, this brings us to the portion of this presentation where I'm going to share some documentation with you. I'm pulling this over to, to show here. Make it a little larger so, it, whoa, not that large. Uh, might be a little easier to see. All right. The CERT contractor, as I mentioned, uses feedback files. And in these feedback files, it, they communicate their CERT review findings with the MAC, like WPSGHA. Now, this particular document that I'm showing is a Word document. It includes the comments on claims for which CERT errors are found or were found. And because I'm unable to actually go into those feedback files, and demonstrate them live for you um, because they're in a secure environment. Environment. I asked our WPS uh, GHA CERT medical review staff to share some of the comments with me and that's what they've done. I've copied and pasted the information for two errors assessed for insufficient documentation which continues to be uh, the category of errors um, that is what is most often assigned when there are errors found for WPS GHA claims. And of course, all protected health information and personally identifiable information has been removed from those feedback files. Uh, let's take a look at the first form of documentation that I'm showing today, and that is this uh, particular, uh, the feedback files. I'm going to try to make it there a little bit bigger for you so that you can follow along. Um, as they do for all CERT reviews, the CERT contractor indicates in their feedback file that they did indeed render a provider enrollment review and this is to make certain that the claim passed provider enrollment validation per Medicare requirements. So you'll see listed right here at the top, the first thing the CERT contractor in their feedback file mentioned was that they did um, 
review the provider enrollment and found that it was valid based on Medicare requirements. Next then you'll find here uh, the CERT review contractors uh, message uh, or feedback uh, that there is indeed an error uh, or missing information rather. Uh, it relates to their medical review decision of course and for this case the treating providers clinical documentation to support frequency for a lipid panel is missing at the top of the page here you'll see that the code submitted and reviewed was 80061 a lipid panel and the date of service was March 17 of 2022 so the, the cert comment says that there is missing clinical documentation to support frequency for the lipid panel. The CERT comment shows that they reviewed the common working file, that's what CWF stands for, and it shows prior billing of this service on March 17 of 2022 and September 15 of 2021. But what is missing is that clinical documentation to support frequency for the lipid panel. The feedback file addresses the medical record documentation that was received from the provider when CERT requested documentation for that lipid panel. Uh, they did receive an authenticated visit note dated March 17 of 2022 that documents the provider's plan for a lipid panel for a beneficiary with hyperlipidemia who will continue Prevostatin 40 milligrams nightly. The note does not support the frequency of performing the billed lipid panel. The comments further note that the CERT contractor received an unauthenticated test result or test request document dated March 17 of 2022 for PSA, lipid panel, and the HGA1C. And lastly, the CERT contractor received laboratory results with the collection date of 317 of 2022. So let's look at the next CERT error assessed for insufficient documentation. This time the code submitted was 87150 and you can see the description uh, was added here to this document. The date of service is 11 uh, 1 of 2021. So this was the, um, the claim sample uh, uh, chosen by the CERT contractor for review. The provider listed on the claim passed the provider enrollment validation. There's a note there that states that. Um, they passed that validation on the review date, which was 11-9 of 2022. And on that same day, the CERT contractor's medical reviews found that the treating physician's order or documentation of the plan or the intent to order the CPT 87150 lab was missing for the 11 1 2021 date of service. That was the date being reviewed. Documentation uh, received included an unauthenticated requisition, an unauthenticated order, and an authenticated progress note for 11 1 of 2021. Uh, that progress note does support diarrhea and complaints of pain and burning and urination. Also received was a lab report that was dated 11 1 of 2021 for other uh, labs that are listed here if you're following along. And just like the first comment that we looked at, the CERT contractor cites the resources upon which they base their decision. You can see in feedback files for both of these, and remember that I cut and pasted them, um, there are references here at the end of the feedback file comments. Um, to identify the resources they used and upon which they based their decision. So, for example, when you see something like 42 CFR, CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulations. Um, there's also some references here to some publications. Uh, publication 100-03 up at the top here is the Internet Only Manual, and those are published on CMS's website. So you'll see here publication 100-03, chapter one, section 190.23 is the specific uh, notification or actually it's a national coverage determination for lipid testing. And then there's some other resources cited there as well. So every time the CERT review contractor sends feedback files to WPSGHA for an error they find, uh, they provide these resources for us. 
All right, next we're going to take a look at some actual documentation uh, for some reviews. And I'll do some switching around here. Pull this open for you. All right. All right. We're going to look at some actual documentation, and this is just in another form of documentation that I plan to share with you today. These are actual documentation examples uh, that have been sanitized. This is the medical record itself that was returned to the CERT contractor when they asked for documentation. And for this, we're going to look at the same two CPT codes as those that we talked about in the feedback files. First of all, we're going to look at records received for 80061, one of those lipid panels. So for 80061, that lipid panel, you can see this progress note includes a review of systems. Uh, the author also includes a new concern. And next, under the heading objective, you will see, I'm going to scroll down here a little bit. Okay you will see the provider's documentation of vitals, there's the exam, lab review, and orders. So for lab review, the provider documented that labs revised and noted that the patient is due for lipids. The progress note also indicates orders written for new lab studies as appropriate and to see the orders. Now, next then in this progress note is the assessment that is followed by the plan. There is documentation that follows that state's test results were reviewed and repeat labs order should ordered prior to the next appointment. There's also documentation that cardiovascular risk and specific lipid and LDL goal were reviewed. Although it's been sanitized and you can't see it, the note was indeed properly authenticated and dated at the bottom here. Jane Dingy is a member of the WPS, GHA Medical Review Team that devotes to uh, CERT reviews and looking at the CERT errors that are assessed for WPS GHA claims. And Jane is often the, um, the staff member who will reach out to providers when an error is assessed on a WPS claim when there's something missing. Uh, so for example, the CERT contractor requested documentation, CERT contractor sends uh, or receives it and finds something to be missing, so they assess an error. Uh, in those feedback files, the CERT contractor would notify us that there was an error assessed, and if something is missing, it is Jane and other staff uh, who may reach out to the provider and ask for that. So I'm going to ask Jane, do you have anything to add or anything in particular that you'd like to talk about for this example? And you'll need to take yourself off mute. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? I can. Thanks, Jane. I can. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, frequently, there are orders sent in. It's actually on the lab requisition, but they're signed by a nurse or they're signed by somebody else in the office. That does not count as an order because it's not sound, signed by the nurse practitioner or the physician. Honestly covered, um, they allow either an order or the, there has to be a progress note that shows intent. And you can see in this note, they plan to do orders. And also that this physician um, realized that the lipids were due and he knows the rule that it is one time a year. This is a frequent one we see um, through. That's what I have. Thank you, Jane. Jane. Thanks for that. All right, let's take a look at another example. Uh, this time for that same CPT code that we looked at um, when we looked at the feedback file documentation. Um, this then is for uh, CPT code 82750, and this is the wound culture. Um, so you'll, you can see the documentation, and this is actual documentation that the CERT contractor looked at. 
uh, and this is where no error was found, just like the last documentation example we looked at. At the top of the note, you will see the heading um, that reads plan of care, and this includes updated wound care orders. And next, under the referral heading, you can find that the lab is checked, or lab is checked, there's a little checkbox there, uh, for wound culture, and that this was collected from the heel wound, collected um, as is shown up in the plan of care. You can also see prescription, coordination of care, and follow-up noted in this particular progress note. And again, you can't see it, but the note is appropriately dated and authenticated. And again, I'm going to put myself on mute and ask Jane if she has any comments to make about this documentation. The documentation clearly puts um, that the, the wound culture was done, where it was done from, and it also has nice orders at the top for what's extended going forward and the activity um, that the patient can have. So if there was not a signed order by the physician, this would count because the intent is in this note. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Great information. All right, let's continue. For some reason, my slide deck advanced there. I must have um, hit the scroll button, so I apologize for that. I do have some great resources that I want to talk about and share with you. Um, starting with the CERT C3 Hub, this is a website that is maintained by the CERT contractor. It's their responsibility to maintain it. Um, you can find links in the left-hand menu when you go to this website that provides for you some um, great resources. Uh, it talks about submitting records to CERT, how you can send them, where you need to send them. Uh, there is examples of letters and contact information there for you. Uh, talks about uh, where they send the CERT documentation requests and how to change a point of contact if you receive a subsequent request for documentation from the CERT contract. You can actually contact them and set those uh, set it up so that those letters come to a specific point of contact within your organization. I know that's one thing that we hear from providers often as it pertains to CERT is that um, it goes to the wrong place. We don't see it. There's examples of attestation letters, document request listings, which is a nice, um, both for Part A and Part B, it actually provides lists of documentation you need to send if you receive a request for documentation from the CERT contractor. And of course, always helpful are those frequently asked questions and even more information. Here are some CMS resources, the MLN fact sheet that's listed there under uh, the, the second full bullet is complying with documentation requirements for lab services, a great resource for you. Here's one example of information from one of the internet only manuals. Um, this one is the section chapter 15 of publication 100-02 that talks about covered medical and other services and specifically in section 80.6 requirements for ordering and following orders for diagnostic tests. I told you earlier that I would provide for you uh, the resource or the uh, the link where you can find those CMS CERT reports. So one of my previous slides had the CERT improper payment rates for 2022 and 2023 and those are dollars associated to those errors. So the CERT reports are very interesting when you actually take a look at them. Um, it breaks things down, place of service, claim type, CPT code and so on and so forth and provider type and this is one of those things that I have recommended recommended actually to providers um, within their organ or in their organizations you know maybe pull some uh, you know take a look at these reports and, and do a pull some records and, and do a self audit to see if the errors that are being identified um, might be something that was also problematic at your place of business um, gives you a great idea for some self audits 
Let's take a look at more resources. We have, of course, the WPS, GHA, Comprehensive Error Rate Testing webpage. Uh, we publish on a quarterly basis our CERT error findings. Um, uh, another great reference for those of you within your organizations that are doing internal audits. And I've included a link to information, uh, drug testing by independent clinical labs, CERT errors. We have a CERT claim lookup tool. If your claim is uh, identified uh, as one, for review by the CERT contractor and you receive a request for documentation, you can check out the status of the review or the review findings. The claim lookup tool is used just for that. You would use the CERT identification number. It's on a barcoded sheet that you receive with your documentation request. And you actually return a copy of that with your records to the CERT contractor. Um, you can use this tool to find out if the uh, review is in valid and usually what happens there is there's some sort of um, typing error, something's uh, transposed. Uh, you can find if there's no error, if you can find if the status is that it's still being reviewed or if an error was found. So that is our CERT claim lookup tool. And other resources are the Social Security Act, of course, that speaks to services uh, that must be medically necessary in order to receive Medicare payment. And here is that link for that section of the Code of Federal Regulations that I've talked about a couple of times already. Our greatest compliment is when our learners recommend WPS GHA education to others, uh, whether it's shared internally or outside of your organizations, please consider recommending our education to others. This will help us reach our goal to provide needed education to all of the providers in our MAC jurisdictions. Thanks for your participation today. 